Welcome everybody, Midlife Gaming Podcast. This is the 21st episode on the 21st day of this month. Steve, how's it going? It's going great, Archie. How about yourself? It's going great. We're done with E3, finally. It kind of felt like a long, dragged-out brawl. Uh, but there's still still news to be had and, and still hot takes to be given. So let's go ahead and get that started. Do-do-do-do. First up, Todd Howard says, focusing on fewer platforms will mean better games. Uh, he was quoted in a interview with uh, Telegraph as saying, do, do, let's get the exact line. It's really good to be able to focus and say, this is what we're creating. And here's the bar when reference to uh, not really focusing on PlayStation consoles. So what's your take on this one? I don't know. I think he's right. Honestly, and I'm not even the biggest fan of Todd Howard, to be completely honest. Mm-hmm. I don't think the quality of what they've been putting out uh, recently has really been up the snuff. But all that aside, um, he's absolutely correct. So when you when a developer gets to focus on one specific set of hardware, they can push that hardware all the way to the limits because they only have those variables to worry about. When you have to develop a game for cross platform across this gen, last gen, PC as well. Like the more complexities you have to throw in there just for the development, mm-hmm. the less resources you have to really, you know, to do polish. And you know, each console has its own architecture, which is going to lead to its own set of bugs. And um, I forgot what game it was, but there was something that recently came out where it just now got a 60 FPS um, update on PS5. Although it's been 60 FPS on like the Xbox One S for uh, forever. I can't remember what the game was, but yeah, he he's right in this case. Yeah, I mean, I agree. It's uh, it's no secret that Bethesda has had a long history with Microsoft. Um, uh, I read a while ago, so I might be incorrect on a couple of key points, but they had worked closely with bringing Morrowind, the third Elder Scrolls series, uh, in with the um, the Xbox. So there was no other console that they were looking at, just the Xbox, because it had DirectX. That was like the whole big deal with it and everything. Uh, but they had a ton of hurdles that they had to overcome because of the limited hardware and Microsoft worked with them. And one of the funniest things that I find about that game is that they were like, Hey, how do we reload massive zones? Oh, well, we'll just basically load out the Ram and soft reboot the entire Xbox mid game. And then that does whatever it needs to do to clear out enough to just like hammer in a brand new zone whenever you're doing like loading and whatnot. So I was like, oh, that's crazy. But I mean, I'm not surprised. I mean, it's new owners, you know, new mindset, I guess. They, they've, they've been working with PlayStation. And even I remember back when they were bringing mods to Skyrim and Fallout on consoles, uh, they were working heavily with Microsoft because they wanted to make sure that it was done in a way that was safe and, and uh, you weren't going to break your console basically. Well, Sony, you know, dragged their feet the entire time on it. Uh, they pushed it away. They didn't want it. They don't like cross play. It seems like they're just not really fun to play with um, corporately. But then, you know, there's other developers out there that say otherwise, that they really appreciate the partnership that they build with Santa Monica Studios or, or Sony directly. And uh, I don't know. Uh, I was not surprised when Starfield was announced as being a Xbox-only title. Uh, I would imagine not a ton of people were announced uh, or were not surprised. Whatever, I would be surprised if uh, Elder Scrolls Six does not make it to PlayStation. Um, I think it's already been established with the Skyrim and I believe, uh, Oblivion, the fourth one was also already on there as well as the, um, the next fallout title I'm sure would, would be on the PlayStation as well, but you know, who knows? It's a, it's a competitor. If Xbox and Microsoft feel that they can save resources and deliver a better product to their customer base, then I don't know. I don't really see a reason why they should play ball. I feel like they, they would, but I don't, I don't know. Uh, I don't foresee a issue that they would have if just everything from Bethesda and Zenimax now 
is just Xbox or PC exclusive. Like let's just deal with it. And that's, that's how it's going to be for now on. I, I wouldn't be too entirely shocked if that happened. Let's see here. So that's really that I don't, I, we haven't seen any gameplay for Starfield, but do you think it's going to, to live up to the hype? I'm really not sure. So they haven't shown gameplay. They have shown in engine footage, right. which actually did look pretty impressive, but I'm not sure yet. I honestly like this isn't for me. This is like the definition of a wait and see. Like I, I need to wait and see. I don't trust Bethesda. I'm sorry. Like I, I understand that they are loved by a majority of the community and mm -hmm. all that good stuff, but I am not impressed by the quality of their games at all. To be honest, like I think they're clunky. I don't think that they're nearly as good as people make them out to be. Like Skyrim oh, yeah. was great for the time, but today if you could see. I mean, if you could see the faults back then, you could definitely see them today. I think by. I mean, if if you had to pick between Bioware and Bethesda, you would go Bioware. Oh, I yeah. think like nine hands down ninety nine percent of the people would, but people don't give. I don't feel like people like the the free passes that people give to Bethesda. I think actually belong to Bioware. Like Bioware has proven themselves over and over again. And yeah, they didn't have mod support and things like that with their releases on PC, but they were so good that most of the time you didn't need them. Like they right. were polished, they worked. Like aside from a, you know, there's always some buggy glitches in these multiple choice type uh, games and things like that, but. Yeah, I just I'm not I'm not impressed by it though. So I have to really see and Starfield is right up my alley in terms of the genre. I love sci-fi, I love RPGs, so like it's right up my alley, but I am watching cautiously just because I I have not been a big fan of like the last fall I enjoyed was actually three. That was like the last one I enjoyed. And I actually yeah. think Vegas was better than three. So I just recently started Vegas, New Vegas back up. I was like, oh wow, this on the the Series X, man, it like it holds up really well. Like obviously, you can still tell it's a 360 title, but it definitely holds up, um, especially with the that weird AI frame boost that it gets. Flawless, it, it, it looks great. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think the reason why Bethesda gets away with so much is because of their overwhelming support for the modding community. Um, they intentionally build framework and tools with just the modding community in mind. And when you do that, I mean, you're going to run into some hiccups here and there. And I'm, I mean, last time I looked at the mod list on Xbox for fallout four, I think the number one or number two most downloaded mod is still a community driven, uh, patch mod, like just just random bug bug fixes and everything that the community came together to fix. And they still exist as bugs if you don't have that patch. So, uh, I don't know. Uh, I feel like any other developer would be drug out into the street if they tried anything like that. Uh, but I, the modding community is very heavily ingrained into the DNA of both Fallout and uh, Elder Scrolls titles. So... I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Uh, I hope that they're, they're modding. I don't know how they view modding won't change with this new buyout, but you never know. I mean, new, new pockets get new says, and, uh, it, there's always going to be the one person that kind of tries to screw it over for extra, extra pennies for everybody else. So I don't know. That's pretty good for that. You have anything else on this one? Nope. Let's move on. You can now see inside some FIFA loot boxes before you buy. Now this one, uh, we talked a little bit about the show or before the show, but I read it the other day and I was kind of conflicted because how we've talked about loot boxes. Like I feel like almost every other episode, a loot box question comes up sometimes and I, I flip flop on it all the time because I believe that it, to a degree, it is gambling. Uh, but I think that it is okay in the right environment. Is a $60 game that you have to buy in order to participate in this activity uh, an okay situation? No. Nah. 
not not even close to being okay for me but it's it's always ea's like top gross like they don't they could stop making other games and just focus on freaking fifa loot boxes and loot packs and player packs and just be good be golden they could continue on for the rest of their days like that uh so i don't know part part of me views it the same as a trading card game uh you know you go to your card shop or walmart or target or wherever and you you punch a couple people and then you buy your pokemon cards and uh you end up with whatever cards you grab like it's it's you know you know what you're going into uh i think the line in the sand though is that i'm not paying sixty dollars up front to pokemon incorporated to play the pokemon card game uh i don't even have pokemon i have magic the gathering cards but um yeah i don't know what what's what's your take on this steve um i i so i have a different opinion than you i don't see any problem with loot boxes never really have um because at the end of the day i think people should be able to spend their money on whatever they want to I think sometimes the execution of the loot boxes is done poorly. Um, you know, maybe they're charged too highly or the chances of getting what you want or that maybe something that you that shouldn't be locked behind a loot box is locked behind a loot box. Like sometimes that happens. But something like this, like a, when I look at people who play FIFA and who actually participate in the ultimate, you know, team stuff, right. like they play these games for thousands of hours, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of hours. So right. for them, um, you know, if they buy this pack, Especially like at this point, where it's like, hey, and I do know also one thing for FIFA, like with all EA sports games, is usually their currency things like there's a way to earn the currency in game as well. Like maybe it isn't, it's pretty grindy to do it, but there is usually a way to earn the currency that you can use to buy these same things as well. Um, So something like this, I actually think is a step forward for them. Like I'm sure there was some pressure, especially in the EU, they have different rules and restrictions over there to where a developer has to list out what the probability of a certain item is in their loot boxes like that to be transparent about that so i think this is maybe an evolution of that like hey let's let's test this out let's see if we could sell just as many as we normally do you know because they could look at the sales number this is a limited time thing which tells me it's some type of experiment they want to know this is something that could be sustainable but hey will people still buy the packs knowing exactly what's inside of it which maybe they you know turn a little dial internally to make the rarity of the items you know show up more frequently or something like that but right I think it's a step in the right direction. Like it is more along the lines of, I don't want to say DLC because if it was DLC, I'd be like, Hey, buy this player, which would really piss people off. But I do think this is at least more transparent and yeah, I, I kind of like this. I so do. what is the difference between this and just simply pay to win then? Uh, there really isn't a difference. I mean, is yeah. it pay to win? Yeah. You yeah. get an advantage over other people, but also okay i mean you could grind out see i i get that but it is also there's an argument that can be made on the other side too like okay why is it fair that a person who has 100 hours to grind out and you know could buy up all the you know say that there is no store market whatsoever which is the case with squadrons and with battlefront 2 so why is it okay that they can dangle these little cosmetic stuff out here for somebody that has to play hours upon hours but a person who wants to spend doesn't have an opportunity to do that. And I'm at a disadvantage just because I don't have the extra time to do it. So I think this is, I've always looked at this as that, that it is a kind of a happy balance. Like, yeah, it sucks. Sometimes, you know, it is a little pay to win. I don't really like it in competitive titles. I'm mm-hmm. um, like shooters really, which in most shooters, they just keep a cosmetic ultimate team. I don't know enough about it to really understand how the whole mechanics of that work, you know, right. your cards versus somebody mm-hmm. else's. I know you unlock players based off the card stats and all that, but, um, that's the way I've looked at it. Like, as long as there is still a way for me to get the same stuff by playing, then I do. I want to complain that some other people can maybe buy it outright. Yeah, sure, I do. But I think it's it's a healthy compromise, right? There really isn't any other option. Like I, I gave the alternative, which is, hey, you only make it to where you have to grind to unlock everything, and then the people who don't have endless amount of time they miss out on all that content. So at least here is, hey, you could either grind for this stuff or you could buy it if you're, you know, a person like me. 33 years old, full-time job, got a kid. Like, I don't always have time to sink hundreds of hours into a game. Like, I right. pick maybe one or two. So when stuff like this comes out, maybe I do want to just spend a quick 15 bucks to throw together a team or something, you know? Yeah, throw together a team and, and at least be somewhat 
challenging, I guess. Be, yeah, be a comparable the... team together and, and, and duke it out. Uh, I think one of the... So on the other side of the fence, what I hear a lot of other gamers talk about is that it's not... In situations like this, it's not fair to the people that don't have the money. So it's, you know, on one side we're like, well, okay, I don't have the time because of real life responsibilities. Of course, that makes sense. It happens. Uh, so I'm just going to drop 20 bucks here for some EA points, buy me a couple of known player packs, like in this situation, uh, and, and start, start running out. What is this? The, the foot event right now, the foot coin or foot summer or something like that, that they're trying. Uh, cause these for everyone watching, these are just like a limited time thing after a certain amount of time, uh, the card pack reshuffles or there's a new one in there. Um, and then after a longer amount of time, they're just going to do, at least for now, they're going to go back to the old system. Unless of course this one does well, then I imagine they'd probably at least talk about implementing a new way to, to do this moving forward. Um, but you know, so we talk about how for players like you and I, who don't have a ton of downtime, to just grind away hundreds of hours into a video game. Uh, but what about the players that don't have a ton of money to just upgrade like that? So, then I mean... They should just play the game. Exactly. But if part of the thing that they've already purchased, that's that's the part that gets me the most, is because, you know, you and eh, I... Eh, eh. Yeah. That's not an excuse, because they still have access to... To the sixty dollar game that they play, they paid for. They're not missing out on any content. It's not like it's locking them out of game mode. It's the only thing. This is an optional game mode. Again, I don't know the specifics of how Ultimate Team works, but yeah, they still have the option to just play the game with the cards that they get. This is like getting an extra roll of the dice. Is the way I assume it works. Like, hey, you probably play enough. Maybe every day you can buy a pack or something, but maybe someone else has the ability to drop some money to buy a pack. And it looks like even looking here, it says 15 packs remaining. So it looks like it even limits the amount of packs that somebody can actually even buy. Right. So I, I, I get it. I do get the argument. But again, there is no other there is no other compromise other than, hey, sorry, you don't have time to play. So F you, you know, which here's, eliminates, which I think a lot the, of. Go ahead. Sorry. No, you go ahead. Okay. So here's why the. Uh why it rubs me the wrong way though that you can go and drop a 60 now if you're buying it on a ps5 you know it's 69.99 uh you're paying that much for a full price game content is on that disc but you do not have access to it unless you pay more or grind significantly higher amount of time so that's the part that gets me the wrong way because back in the day when like you know we were in super nintendo and n64 era we didn't have online services so everything that was on that cart or on that disc for you know ps2 or whatnot it was there so you had to play it you had to grind out but i think the distinction is is that the grinding is significantly different compared to today now grinding is used as a deterrent or not a deterrent as a method to encourage people to drop money into these packs as opposed to being a legitimate way to earn it. Now I'm just speaking in general. I don't play FIFA. I don't think I could be paid enough to play FIFA. It's just not my type of game, but it's, it happens in several different environments where, where you have to, you have to acknowledge that, you know, back in like what smash melee, you had to drop 99 hours to get Mewtwo, I think is what the, the deal was in multiplayer. Uh, that was like a tall order, but now for something like this, where you're trying to get, just get another, uh, player, you know, do you have to drop the money? It, it, it falls on the balance that is inside the game. So I don't want to just come out and say, oh yeah, FIFA's trash for doing it this way. Cause I don't know. It could be something as simple as like, oh yeah, you play, you play four matches in a day. Boom. Get you. That's enough foot coins which is just the weirdest fucking name for a in-game currency. Um, get enough foot coins and you can buy this pack that you know is exactly what is in it. I'm, I am comfortable with something like that. Uh, that makes sense. 
It doesn't seem schmarmy. It seems just like, hey, let's let's push this player to keep engaging inside of our ecosystem. I understand that. It makes sense. Not against it at all. I'm against the predatory way of where like, and this is another one where you and I don't see eye to eye on is the whole Star Wars Battlefront situation that happened at first. People didn't want to grind that hard for uh, what just, I think the, the, the skin that was being talked about the most at the time was Darth Vader. Um, I don't want to grind that much because the time spent to get him through the game that you paid your $60 to pay to play the time spent there does not equate the amount of money that someone can just drop right off the bat and go, all right, well I burned through all these loot boxes, which at the time you didn't know what was in them. You just kind of hoped you were getting the right thing and you got enough. That's shards. not true. Yeah. You got so, enough shards. You, you knew. That's not true though. What's that's not, not true. true. And that's exactly what you just said. And that's why all this stuff about like, and this is what I mean. Like, it's no offense to you, but people yeah, yeah. just read a headline and then they like right now we're we're spending ten minutes plus talking about EA doing this, but Destiny does it with oh, the Eververse. Absolutely. Overwatch does it. Like, people just love to beat up on EA, and it's not fair. And in this case, like, they're even going a step above what other people are doing. They're telling you immediately, "Hey, here's what's inside the pack." So no one else is doing that. I'm but with this. the Star Wars thing, with the Star Wars thing, that absolutely is not how it was at all. What happened there, Kotaku, PC Gamer, whoever the hell it was, those guys put out these articles because they know, just like we're doing right now, people get very animated regarding loot boxes, get very oh, yeah. enthusiastic, whatever you want to call it. And people love to beat up on EA, but it took one day to unlock Darth Vader. It didn't take massive weeks or anything like that. Right. And the whole thing about the currency was, it was, hey, you either, the currency, you get it through the matches, so you can literally do the math to find out oh, I just need to do X number of matches to get this many coins, and then I unlock them. There were only like six un- there were only like six unplayable or right. six unlockable characters at the beginning, so you have to make it a challenge. You can't just, okay, hey, so I think a day of grinding, that's that's not bad for who's supposed to be the most badass person in the entire Star Wars universe. Yeah, but a day and of grinding And then in terms of the loot boxes, they weren't even loot boxes. It was, here's a box. Each one of these has cosmetics. They each have this set amount of coins in it as well. Or you can buy just the shard thing outright. So there was no guessing work to it whatsoever when it came to if you want to unlock Vader or not. It was either play X number of matches or buy the shard pieces. And again, if I am a grown man, which I am, I don't have whatever amount of time it takes to unlock him. But I love the Star Wars universe. Why shouldn't there be an option for me to just spend 15 quick bucks and unlock him? We do this in every other thing. Every Nintendo. Other avenue, yeah. No one, no one beats up Nintendo for keeping their game sixty bucks for ten years. No one does that. Oh, no one beats up Nintendo for I releasing know. these. <laughs> Nintendo, and you brought up a perfect example. So Melee, Brawl, all those games where Nintendo had upwards of probably a hundred characters in them, right? Great. Flash forward to now, and what does Nintendo do? They piecemeal out these characters in DLC packs. So again, it's like everyone in the industry is doing it. It just seems like people unfairly beat up on. EA because it's oh, a sports yeah. game. It's like, oh man, it's a sports game, so they shouldn't be able to do this. Meanwhile, neither one of us even play this fucking game. So no. how are we educate <laughs> no. even how are we educate to even talk about if this is if the packs are good or not? Like so I think I just think it's unfair. And I think we're being unfair by beating up on them about something we literally oh, yeah. don't know anything about. Well, yeah, but that's, this why, right. that's why both of us brought up the whole that it's about the balance of the situation. It's not it, you know we've both said that we're not, we've, we don't play FIFA, so we can't speak directly on what the intricacies are for, Hey, play four games, get this pack versus play forever and, and do this. You know, yeah. I see Tom in the chat as well, instigating over there. <laughs> uh, so um, it, we're talking the same thing. I, I play, I just don't get it. I Why is there so much hate day? about, I don't even see how anyone could be negative about, this stuff i don't i don't i don't get it you what is the alternative what do you mean what is what is the alternative there is well, what is the back, alternative it goes to, back to what we always say vote with your wallet if you don't like it don't don't buy it get your money back return it my thing is so these companies they do this because there's like maybe uh sports title isn't the best because those are usually dead in a year or so but mm-hmm. something like destiny something like 
trying to think of uh, Warzone. Like those games, if they don't have that consistent income coming in from the microtransactions from oh, yeah. cosmetics, blah, 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 the game dies after that year. And you go back to getting these yearly, which they still do as well. They put the yearly titles out, but that's what happens. So you kind of development costs go up every year. They don't get cheaper oh, as yeah. the fidelity of games and things go up. The cost to make them goes up. Oh, definitely. They don't raise the price. Like, yeah, you know, it's easy to look at PS5 and Xbox Series X and be like, oh man, they're 70 bucks now, but they're 70 dollars because no, now they're supporting two or on the Xbox side, two pieces of hardware on the PS5 side. You know, the one they're still supporting the PS4, the kind of. the Xbox, <laughs> whatever the hell was before that PC. So like to develop for those many different platforms, like Todd Howard was saying, like it's, it's, it's expensive, not easy. man. Yeah, yeah. So I mean. For me, and I don't know, maybe a little bit of it is because I've been, you know, you and me both been in the business world forever, but especially now being like on the dev side, like we looked at it, saw how much time it took us just to do a project that took us two months. And man, when you look at the hours versus how much we actually got back, like, okay, yeah, we made a decent chunk of change, but right. we also spent a decent chunk of time on doing everything we did. And you have to, if you're going to keep the audience coming back in something like FIFA where they have the season and they're doing the match or the the player updates and all that, like you do need the money to keep coming in. So I don't know. I, I just think it's the future and we shouldn't keep fighting about the presence of loot mechanics. We should be fighting about the execution of them because they're yeah, not the going away. Of it. And while we're, you know, while the minority of us are fighting, Oh man, stop doing it. There's whales in every single game Absolutely. that regardless of what we're saying, they're going to keep doing it. So the only way to get change to happen is by, Coming together and saying, hey, this is how you execute it, which is exactly what happened with EA when it came to Star Wars. They said, okay, we heard you loud and clear. You guys don't like that. We're not doing it anymore. And they haven't done it again since then. Like, right. So, I again, this is EA Sports. It's a whole different ballpark. But right. for all their other EA games, they haven't put a loot box in any of them. They already announced Battlefield uh, 4 isn't going to have any microtransaction BS, I guess they said. Um, oh, uh, 2020. Actually, I'm yeah. confusing that with, I was confusing that with Halo. Sorry. So I take that back. They have not confirmed that yet. Halo confirmed no uh, oh, loot infinite, boxes on no the, their battle pass, which is great because that was but... a pain in the ass when uh, when we were trying to play Halo Five with uh, Ben from Blue Grace. Uh, I was like, "What is what is this? What is this nonsense in my Halo game? Get this out of here! I don't want this." Like it was just it was weirdly imp- implemented, and I don't even mean from like a fairness stance. It was just in general, it was not a smooth experience to figure out what you're doing with these uh cards and whatnot when you're going into these these battle maps or battle zones whatever they were called in in halo 5 but yeah no i we're you and i are both in agreement in how the proper way is to move forward with with loot boxes and everything i don't think loot boxes should go away we all understand that well you and i at least understand that loot boxes are a requirement especially for free-to-play titles I think it just rubs people the wrong way when they have to pay for a full price to get into an ecosystem and then to be good at the ecosystem, they have to keep buying more, which again, don't know if FIFA is one of those, but you know, in all due time, they'll, they'll eventually find a way that maximizes profit, but also maximizes player engagement. And that's really, I think the goal for both, both sides as a player i want to be engaged more and as a seller of video games they want me to be engaged more so that i can buy more loot boxes or or player cards or whatever the situation is so yeah i think that's that's a good little wrap up on that one so let's move along right on to guardians of the galaxy dev says it's single player for better storytelling this is one that you and i uh have for the most part, I would say the same, same, same agreements is that it's hard to tell a very deep storyline in a multiplayer slash massive multiplayer setting nowadays. Like if you're going to have an environment, you need to have something that me as a player feels uh, immersed inside of. So what's your take on this one? I um, actually thought that this was a weird quote from the um, from the game director. Mm-hmm. I get what they're trying to do. They want to separate themselves. Um, so um, for those who don't know, the Guardians game is also coming from Square Enix via um, Crystal Dynamics, same guys that did the Avengers game. Um, and the 
the whole thing is I guess they're they're really trying to differentiate this from the Avengers game because the Avengers right. game obviously did poorly. If it had done well, they would be like, oh yeah, we're in the same universe and all that good stuff, I'm sure. But <laughs> anyway, his um his whole thing was for us to really tell an engaging story, we have to have a single player perspective. That way you really feel like you're a part of a team and you're seeing how your teammates are reacting to situations versus you kind of bounce in between everybody where you really have no true identity, which I do kind of understand. Um, it makes sense. Um, as we were scrolling down, actually, there was a Telltale game um, ad that came up for some reason. I have no clue why. <laughs> but um, maybe it was because there was a Telltale uh, Guardians game. I know oh, I saw maybe. something. But but um, anyway, there is a way to do it. I actually thought the Avengers game had a pretty good story. I didn't have any complaints about the story. I thought a lot of the complaints up front from that original EA trailer, like the character models definitely were kind of uncanny Valley, but when you actually played the game, they improved the visuals by then. And the story was very coherent. I actually really enjoyed the story. Um, so I, I kind of get what he's saying here. I, I do understand a little bit of it. You know, they're thinking, I just think it's kind of a cop out though to say that you can't tell a good story with multiple characters. I I disagree with that because you can't. You could tell different things from their perspective. Uh, Last of Us Two does a great job of that. You know, you play as two distinctive different people over right. the course of that game. Uh, there's other games that I'm sure I can't remember right now. So, I mean, more power to them if they think that this is the best way for them to tell their narrative. Then by all means, they're the experts at the story they want to tell. So let them tell it the way they want. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say I wouldn't say that it is. I wouldn't agree wholesale with what he said, that it is the single best way for storytelling. I'm, there's been storytelling experiences. I mean, I've stayed up many nights reading fucking stories about EVE Online and crazy shit right. that went down in that universe that no one wrote at all. They're not scripted, you know, that's just emergent happened. gameplay that came from, you know, MMO, just having that world. Same thing with Elite Dangerous, you know, it's a massively multiplayer game. And sometimes I read the news articles that they have lore wise inside of there. And I'm like, man, they're telling a, a deep story that's lasted years at this point. So, yeah, I don't agree with this, but I do agree with, hey, if you maybe this team specifically, they need to focus on that specific style for the story they want to play. Like, hey, you are Peter Quill. You're watching everything else go on around you cool so good for them i'm yeah, excited yeah. um not a pre-order for me but i'll keep an eye on it yeah i'll definitely keep an eye on it and, and i understand what they're trying to get at they're they're trying to follow that same line of like like mass effect you you only really play as shepherd in shepherd's decisions and how shepherd interacts with his teammates or her teammates their teammates and that is I don't know how how invested I would have been in a Mass Effect where you are independently controlling each player. Like obviously in combat you can, uh, well, kind of, but I don't know. I I understand what he's saying. I don't know if I fully believe in it being the best, but maybe for his team and his storyboard people that that was the best way that they could go forward to, you know, I mean, it's difficult to tell a good story. It's not the easiest thing in the world to just like whip out a solid narrative and, and just go forward with making a video game for it. So it's very likely that for his team, their team that uh, is developed the crystal dynamics, like, right. That's who's responsible for this one. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily Crystal Dynamics. I know it is Square Enix. Right. Um, I honestly can't remember. Yeah, I can't remember off the top of my head either. But um, yeah, I'll I'll keep an eye on this one because it looked it looked interesting. Not quite sure how I feel about the blending of like the comic vibes and the movie vibes, but I mean they're both good vibes. So why not? Why not give it a shot then? Uh, you got anything else on this one? Not a. Nada. Let's move on. So, Xbox has at least 27 games coming to Game Pass day one of launch. Uh, we talked a little bit about this during the E3 kind of recaps and whatnot. Um, I, I mean, Game Pass is just being proven to be the best way to experience new games on both PC and on Xbox. It just... If you're on either of those environments, like I don't, I don't know why you wouldn't at least give it a try to see if it works out for you. 
Uh, now you, I don't know, have you gone back to Game Pass yet or no? Nope. Uh, it's not for me. How so? Explain for people. I am not a a la carte. Well, this isn't really a la carte. I'm not a buffet gamer. Like I don't, I don't need a gaming subscription service because I have a very distinct taste of what I want to play. I know what I want to play. I know what is worth the buy for me. I know what is worth the, Hey, I'll get it on sale. I know what's pay hey, all. I don't have a console that I actually play anymore, but I mm-hmm. back in the day, I would know, eh, this is worth the rent. Like that was a skill for me. Usually was wait for a sale. Disregard it completely. Day one purchase, rent it. You know, like yeah. um, so. That's usually how I used to consume games. Now, being a PC gamer, I consume a, a lot the same. But usually, it's just to either ignore it completely, you know, wait for a sale, or buy a day one for me. Um, so, Game Pass doesn't work for me because I don't want to play. Just I don't. I don't need that massive library game. Like I usually right. get a core set of games that I stick with and play for the long haul. You know, my Grand Theft Auto Five Elite. Uh, Destiny's probably up there, Star Citizen, Flight Sim, like that type of stuff that I'm going to play for the long call. Mm-hmm. Then I have the little single player narratives that I'll wait for a sale because I know they're going to be like a six hour thing or a six to 10 hour, whatever. Run through those real quick. And then if there's something else kind of in between, you know, again, I'll just, I'll either wait for it. I just won't. If I, usually if I don't pre order something, I probably don't want to play it that badly, right. to be completely honest. And then like the, like uh, Outer Worlds is a good example. So that's the game where I might pick up Game Pass for a month just to play something like Outer Worlds. So that is a good way I would use Game Pass. Like if there's something that was single player and I knew that I just wanted to play for a month or so, I would do that. But I don't know if this is by design or if it's just kind of lucked out that way. But when you look at the offering of what Microsoft offers uh, from their own published games, like they really don't have any one and done titles. Like so, I don't know if this is going to pause here on screen or if that is that the image I sent. That's the image. Yes. Okay, cool. So, like, if you look at their um, available today stuff, uh, whatever, like, but even their available today stuff, look at the catalog. All of these titles are things that you're going to play for some substantial amount of time. It's not something to where you're going to be over with it in a month. Like, you look at your Forza, your Halo, your mm-hmm. Sea of Thieves, uh, the Fallout games. Like, none of the stuff is this little small um, kind of. It's not those small contained single player narratives that used to be, hey, I'll I'll get this out the two dollar box. Like this is all stuff they're gonna want to play for a consistent amount of time. So yeah. for me, it makes sense for you to just buy it outright. But for I've always said that the Xbox Game Pass is perfect for the casual gamers, it's perfect for kids, it's perfect for parents who are trying to get their kids in the game. And or if you're, you know, maybe you run a doctor's office, stuff like that. Like it's perfect for those people who don't always know exactly what they want to play. They just want to load it up and see what's available right. you know, to play that day. Um, but yeah, for me, because I know that I'm going to buy so much of it, it's just it economically, it makes more sense for you to just buy it outright than to go through the subscription because at the end of the subscription, you don't own these games. So, uh, right. flight simulator, for instance, if right now, that's probably the only thing I hear that I've played consistently for the long run. I did play horizons for a while too, but. Oh, you didn't so play among us it, for a long time. I think I played maybe 12 <laughs> matches in total my entire life. <laughs> but I'm um, like flight simulator. So I've got a thousand hours on that. That came out in October of last year, maybe August. I can't remember. But at this point, I if I had been in Game Pass paying the 15 bucks per month, I would have bought flight simulator probably two times over. So it made sense for yeah. me to just buy that outright. But again, I, I still recommend Game Pass for a lot of people. It's just not for me because I don't consume enough like odd games to uh, to really to really justify it. One thing I will say, when they come to Steam, that might change my mind. Um, depends on like how the Steam interface works with it and everything, because there's stuff on here like Hades. Mm-hmm. That's something where it costs me 20 bucks to buy Hades. I haven't played it since I beat it, and that's a reoccurring, um, you know, it's a roguelite, so you can go through that multiple times. Right. But if Game Pass was attractive on Steam to where there was a lot of indie stuff that I probably would play, then maybe that would kind of spruce it up. But as of right now, the, the offer is kind of very heavy to AAA and AA games, you know? Yeah, for me. Hey, Doctor Pretender. Hey, what's going on, Doctor Pretender? Uh, for me, it's very much a uh, strictly financial decision. It it blends in well enough with my gaming style. Um, I used to be the person that would like insist on having the hard copies for games, but I don't really even see it anymore or see the the value in it more. Because yeah, you have a physical disc for your game, but nowadays it's just an install disc, like sometimes the data is not even on there. You still have to have a day one patch to make any of it work properly. Uh, 
you know, there's a security patch sometimes is integrated into the day one patch. So it, in my eyes, I can't go back, like say in 50 years, I can't go blow the dust off of my series X and chuck in a, uh, uh, I don't know, whatever game is coming out recently, uh, chuck a disc into it and expect it to work flawlessly. Uh, I might be able to piggyback it into some, you know, private network that's being held up by, you know, Patreon subscribers or something like that. But that's, that's, that's it. Like there's no real benefit for me and how I like to manage my games. So I have slowly evolved into the person that I don't want to be, which is the guy that's just buying digital titles just because you're like, well, uh, I don't want to have this thing taking up space here. I know I'm not going to get my money back from it, uh, from GameStop. I might get a good amount back, but you know, it's really hit or miss on if you're going to get anything worth it, uh, back. Um, so I might as well just save the time, save the effort and kind of go the casual route. Like you said, you don't do, uh, I definitely follow the casual route when it comes to gaming nowadays, even though I used to not. So it just, it works for me. Uh, especially now that a lot of these studios that are under the Xbox umbrella or yeah, the Xbox games umbrella, um, are games that I know I'm going to play and I probably won't play for, you know, a terribly long time. Like I'll, I'll definitely be playing, you know, Starfield outer worlds two is coming out. We talked about atomic heart like several weeks ago. I'll definitely be playing that one because it looks, it looks interesting enough. Um, and then these games that are in the middle. Halo Infinite, I absolutely will be playing. So already we're talking about, you know, upwards of $250 worth of titles that I know I'm going to be playing. So I might as well just drop the 14 bucks a month and know that I'm going to be getting those titles preloaded on my Xbox the day they come out. And I can just play them and then delete them off and move on with whatever next is life with life. If I really like a title, I will, however, still pick up the physical disc. Why? I don't know. I don't see the the true value in it anymore because see, I only bought titles that I knew I wanted to keep uh like for a while. I don't think that I have really I think I've only traded in games at a GameStop maybe maybe like two times and it wasn't a ton of them. It was like, "Hey, I have some of these duplicate games that I got from this lot sale or Someone offloaded their 360 titles over to me, went through them. All right, these ones are good ones. I don't care about these games. Let me go drop those off as well. So, I mean, we both recommend it. We both recommend it for different reasons. This one is for me. I heavily push Game Pass to my friends because it's so easy. Like like tomorrow, uh, tomorrow, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, uh, Dungeon Dragons Dark Alliance comes out that like third person like action title from them. Uh, it's on Game Pass, and I was like, oh snap, that's tomorrow. You know, I don't have to worry worry about my budget or anything like that. I'm a I'm a student being supported by my wife right now, so money is definitely not just flying all over the place. So this is absolutely a benefit for me because now tomorrow I can just download it and play it with my buddy. I'm like, oh yeah, let's go, let's get it. It's in here. And that's not even a, a Xbox umbrella dev. That is, I think it's just Wizards of the Coast and some some third party dev uh, threw it together. Not threw it together. They built it. It looks pretty pretty good. Um, so I mean, other other partners of Microsoft are coming out and going, oh, this is a good way to get our our name out there. And you know they're they're selling an expansion pass. I I get the the business model because you only get the base game. You don't get like the it. Well, I think there's been a few exceptions to the to the rule, but you don't normally get the DLC that comes with it, like any pre-order DLCs or any armor packs or whatnot. But you can always buy those. So if you if you want to, I mean, I'm sure that's part of the deal that they strike up. It's like, hey, uh, we'll give it to you for free, but hopefully, hopefully you end up buying something from us and you know, yeah, I think most people end up, if it's something you like it, it makes sense to buy it. I've seen a lot of people on our forum or on our discord ask me about how to upgrade from game pass to the physical cut, co- not the physical, but the, I'll say the retail real. copy of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because some people, again, that the math 
depending on how you play, it doesn't work out if you don't if you right. don't take advantage of the service. You have to take advantage of the service for the the finance piece of the workout. And but it, it is cool just Xbox to know Live. that you get the yeah um, the and there was a really good deal back man for like a full year you could add if you already had an existing Xbox Live membership you could extend that for a period and then change that over to the ultimate for like mm-hmm. nothing. Yeah, it was really good, but it was yeah, like a dollar um, to still, convert your entire existing subscription. It was crazy. Yeah. Now, if I had kids, this is all my kids would have. I would probably like maybe for birthdays and Christmas, I'd buy them multi-platform stuff that wasn't day one Xbox exclusive. But for the most right. part, if I had a young kid, this is all they would have. They'd have the console. They'd have Xbox Ultimate. That way I don't have to worry about anything. It would be like my mom used to tell me like, oh, you know, you've got 20 Sega games in there. Well, to kids now, you've got hundreds of games that you could be playing right oh, now. Yeah. Go play one of those, you know, and we'll wait for this one to go on sale type thing. But God, remember plus, remember back in the day when we would like rent terrible ass games from, from Blockbuster and just like, oh, I guess this is what video games are. And it's just the most <laughs> horrible, you know, DC versus Looney Tunes type of nonsense. You're like, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> Returning. <laughs> yeah, All right. But- you got any closing notes on this one? Nope. Let's move along. Tekken producer confirms the death of Tekken X Street Fighter. Uh, This is a game that I didn't even know was in the works, but it makes sense that it kind of came back to light with uh, the new character for Smash announced. What's your take on this? Yeah, um, I tossed this one in just to keep it brief. Not huge news. Um, mm-hmm. Definitely the fighting segment is a niche market within video gaming, but I thought this one, this one was kind of interesting just because the reason that the director or the producer cited for why the project ultimately ended up in development hell. So um, it was announced at, a, I think it was Comic-Con, yeah, San Diego Comic-Con in 2010 mm-hmm. was when this was actually announced. Um, obviously, there's a successful Marvel vs. Capcom series. There's a successful DC versus. Uh, more combat S&K there's and... there's street fighter versus tekken so this was supposed to be another spoke off that same wheel um but ultimately what they made it sound like was that the tekken team actually is the reason why this ultimately didn't end up happening um their thing was that they didn't want to divide the player base up between too many titles uh, which i thought was pretty interesting because when i think of tekken i can't even think of when the last one came out so it is not something that is I feel like in the mainstream eye as often. So this yeah. is something that I really felt. I just think it's a weird decision. I would have let this come out. Uh, street fighter is obviously the more popular of the two. There's most likely going to be a street fighter movie coming out here. As soon as it seems like off the success of moral combat, they're going back to all those nineties flicks and right. trying to breathe some new life into them. Um, but yeah, Tekken has not even been in my vision. I can't remember the last time there was a title. So I'm surprised that they did not jump at this easy opportunity to let obviously street fighter is a more popular game than Tekken's ever been. I'm surprised they didn't take up um this opportunity. Did the Tekken honest. team did the Tekken dev team help with uh the that Pokemon fighting game, the Pokemon tournament? Ooh, I never played that, so I have no idea. I played it for a little bit. It was it was it was pretty fun. But uh yeah I'm with you. I I mean the last Tekken that I actually sat down and played was honestly uh, a Tekken 3 for the PS1. And I still go back and play it sometimes just because it's a fun fighting game. But um, yeah, yeah, I don't I don't know why that, that type of remark would be made, though, because I don't... What other things are they partnering with? I know they're big in Japan, especially in the arcade markets, because that's... The arcade market in Japan is still huge. Uh, went there in, what, end of 2019, and... Uh, God, so so many arcades and they're so large. I'm actually a little sad because the Sega arcades are all shut down now, like permanently. They're closed. They're gone. So that'll be sad that we can't go back to see those again. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know why that would be a an excuse. I mean, I guess it's reasonable. It's their IP. They can do whatever they want with it. But um, I don't. It, did Tekken ever make the jump over to uh, Xbox? Or no? Mm, I honestly don't recall. Yeah, I don't. I think there's still like predominantly a. Well, no, I see Xbox uh, Tekken Seven for Xbox One. So yeah, they did make the jump somewhere. Um. Yeah, I don't know. It's quick story, I guess. Sure, we know that we're getting a Tekken character in Smash, which is 
just the weirdest thing when I when I saw that on the Nintendo E3 thing, Treehouse event or Treehouse Live event, I was kind of like confused as into why why Tekken would come over to the Nintendo realm. But I guess it's just because you know Smash is such a such a hit uh, in various different communities. It might have been an attempt to keep prevalence in that very saturated fighting world now, because Sony uh, Sony bought out Evo tournaments, which is the fighting tournaments. Uh, they bought that company or, or whatever situation uh, they bought it out, so they're responsible for it now. So. I don't know, maybe this has something to do with it. They're like, hey, listen, Tekken tournaments, they don't do so hot anymore. But Smash tournaments, they sell tickets. Get get one of your Tekken people over to Smash, cross-germinate your player base, and hope some of them find their way to Tekken, maybe. I don't know. Uh, I, I'm sure they wouldn't have done it if it was just for giggles, I guess. All right, you got anything else on that? Nope. Nope. Let's move on. That's it for the news, everybody. We're going to move on. We're going back to uh, our on the radar section, which we skipped for two weeks because of E3, because it took a lot of time to get through all that E3 shenanigans. All right. So on our radar, uh, Steve, would you like to go first? Sure. All right. So on my radar this week, I picked War of the Sea. Um, not much here. Um, it just looks like a strategy game. One thing I liked about it was that they have multiple dynamics going. So it's not just uh, ship combat. It's not just aircraft combat. It has the hold, um, which you can see here on screen now. It simulates these whole naval warfare scenes. So you've got the carriers fighting. You've got the submarines. You've got the air reinforcements coming in. I love big strategy games like this anyway. So this is one I put on my um, put on my wish list. I think it was 30 bucks, which is a little steep for me right now. This is more like a 20 buck one because I'm I'm not going to play it that often. I think usually the way this will work is I'll play it in like a spurt or probably like 15, 20 hours right. or the course of a week, get bored of it, come back to it, you know, when I have nothing else to play. So um, but yeah, it looked good enough for me to add to my wish list. So that's what's on my radar this week. It looks pretty uh, high quality for sure. It uh, has an interesting camera system. Yeah, let me know how yeah, that works. Because I'm, um, I'm down for like these these war sims. Uh, I'm about it. Yeah, I will definitely do so. Cool. How about you? What do you got on your radar? So on my radar, I already brought it up a little bit, but it's uh, Dungeons and Dragons Dark Alliance. The game looks fun. It looks like it's going to be a, a a nice little, uh, probably not a quick run through. I haven't checked to see what the expected like play time is, but it's on Game Pass. <laughs> Hey, thanks, Virtual Girl Cosmetics, for the follow. Appreciate you. Uh, so I'm going to be playing Dark Alliance with my buddy uh, uh, Justin, who is probably in the chat right now. Um, it's a game that is very reminiscent to uh, Baldur's Gate that we used to play back in the original Xbox era. So we were like, oh, yeah, dope. Let's throw it down. Let's 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 get this game. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to buy it or not. And then this is a perfect example of when the Game Pass situation worked in my favor. Because it's like, oh, okay. Uh, it's out tomorrow. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, but it's on Game Pass, so I'm going to play it. Uh, I might stream it. Who knows? Uh, just got a couple of, of awesome little pieces of equipment that my wife bought for me. So I might give it a test run and stream. So keep, a, keep an eye out on that one. Uh, but that's all I got on my radar, Steve. Uh, is it time well, cool. for for video game twenty questions? Um, not yet. Not there was yet. one. So remember, remember we uh, so we didn't have listener questions this week. Oh, uh, yeah. Usually we'll throw those up on Reddit, but we did have a funny tweet that we came across. It. Oh my god! <laughs> uh, sorry, I don't know why my headphone fell out. Uh, so Jordan saw me retweet this. I retweeted as a joke, honestly, but <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was what video game adaption would you like to see um, adapted by or adapted into a movie back by Zack Snyder? So what video game series, entry, whatever, would you like to see made into a movie that would be directed by Zack Snyder? I'll let you go first. What, right, so, what is that game? so for for the record, we're referring to a tweet by at Zack Snyder Bible. So clearly there's no bias for him. 
<laughs> but None uh, whatsoever. But they they included their choice, which was Mass Effect series, which I think would be pretty pretty okay, especially given uh I don't know. Uh, just given the the world, sure. I just would be so afraid that he would just take the reins and run all over it. So I don't I don't know if I would really want that. Uh cuz I I I'm with you. I played Mass Effect enough times that I was okay with the story that I finished out with. I really don't want people going back and screwing around with that story. But it would be nice if it if he like took over the first contact wars or something like that. But I would think that a good just like IP to get back out there to try again for I think what the fourth time would this would probably be like the fourth time would be the Doom Eternal. So the original Doom series, they have a little bit of lore. And you're like, okay, I, I'm not playing Doom for the lore. I'm like, all right, I'm just out there to to murder a bunch of demons and and keep on slaying. Uh but Doom Eternal and Doom 2016, uh they had a ton of good lore, I felt like, in my opinion, that doesn't really get explored inside of the game itself. So I would like to see if he could do something valuable with that IP, not with Doom Slayer, though. I think that as as I was thinking about these, these games, uh, the movie conversions, uh, the main thing that came to mind was I don't want him touching main characters. I don't want him to have any say over what the player character is doing. Side stories, perfect. Sure, why not? But the main thing, I don't I don't think it would go too well. What about you? Um, for me, I would keep it simple. You gotta play to his strengths. Um when I think about Zack Snyder, he's a visual director. That's mm-hmm. his first and foremost thing. But watching um watching the Snyder cut, I honestly think that he has not been given fair treatment. Like he actually made a deeply personal story there. Like, yes, yeah. it took four hours, but that was an incredible story. Like, even I've rewatched that twice at this point now. Um, just be, and which is rare for me. I really don't like to rewatch movies, right. especially not four hour long ones. But the the story, to, the character development is actually really great in that um, in the Snyder cut. But for me, I my movie would be uh, Gears of War. I think that mm. that is like right up his alley because yeah. it is it does the dark thing. It does the comedy, but it does it in a dark way. It's not Josh Whedon style comedy. It's literally up his, you know, up his alley where the comedy right. is just regarding the circumstances that they're in. When you think about the big spectacle of the battles, you know, um, yeah. what was the what's the hell the hammer called? The hammer of war is that what it's called? Hammer of dawn, hammer of war. But like even the first yeah, time that sure. that thing comes out in the uh, in the first gears um, game when you're fighting that, you know, the first boss in that opened area there. So, like, there's so much visual stuff that he could do in that universe. I think that's, like, right up his alley, oh, um, yeah. honestly. Because he, again, I, I understand where people come from. I understand where you come from, where you don't want him to touch main characters because you're afraid of him changing them uh, to an extent, you know, kind of fit, like, his vision and things. But I think Gears of War already kind of lies in his playground or, like, in that peripheral that zone, vision of yeah. how he likes to direct anyway. So I don't think it would be a big departure. And he'd probably have fun with the... uh the budget, the characters, you know, we could Batista needs to be in there, of course. Uh, but <laughs> yes. Yeah. That would uh that would be mine though. Definitely, definitely, definitely. All right, those good good picks. Uh in the chat or if you're watching this later on YouTube, hit us up in the comments. What would you pick to be a video game to be reworked into a movie by Zack Snyder? That was a good question. Funny, funny question, but still still a decent one. All right, so now now is it now is it is it time now? Now? It's time. It's time now ready? for video game 20 questions. For those of you who do not know, one of us, we alternate every week. Uh, one of us picks a game, keep it to ourselves, and the other one has to guess what the other game is based off of normal 20 question rules, which is we can only ask yes, no questions, and we only get 20 of them. So without further ado, Steve, go ahead. All righty. This 1998 title, it's an action adventure title, made by a Japanese developer, was the first 3D entry in the series. So this 1998 Japanese developed title was the first 3D entry in a series. Hmm. Let me see. 
Hold on, I'm pulling up my death counter here real quick. All right. So, 1998, action adventure, first 3D entry in series. Uh, 98 was... Is this a PlayStation 1 game? It was not. Was not. Uh, okay. So, was not a PlayStation 1 game. Was it an N64 game? It was not. It was not. Uh, was this a Dreamcast game? It was. Dreamcast game. Oh, okay. This is not my realm of expertise at all. Uh, Dreamcast. Action Adventure 1998. First 3D entry. It's not a Sonic title because Sonic's first 3D game was Sonic 3D. And that was on the Saturn, I think. Or the... What was the... Yeah, I think it was the Saturn was was what that uh that game was on. So it's not a Sonic game, I don't think at least. Uh action adventure game. Man, what a console to pick. I had like almost no experience other than like my neighbor had one and I saw it for about 30 minutes. Um Green Pass action adventure is it a current ip meaning is the ip currently in in like gaming it is um while you're talking though the judges messaged me and they said that the sonic 3d title that you're referring to from sega saturn was not a 3d title although it had 3d models the world itself that's right yep that's a good catch so is this a Sonic game? It is. <laughs> oh, I would have been. You should have just let me hang myself with that. <laughs> Couldn't do that. We have to be fair on this show. But <laughs> uh, so is this? Does that mean that this is a uh, Sonic Adventure? It is Sonic it is. Adventure. Look at that. It's not Sonic Heroes. I thought, My favorite. It's. I horrible. thought. I thought I was going to throw you off, but I didn't think that you were going to. That you're gonna state it, so I didn't think I would have to correct you. But, <laughs> but yeah, the first one, um, the first one was not actually 3D. It was just so the model is 3D, but the world is still 2D. That is true. I completely. And they use simulated flex. Uh, they just simulate the background and make it look 3D with a lot of uh, a lot of illusions. Yeah, a lot of that. Did you ever play that one, Sonic 3D? I did. Yeah. Um, the thing I remember about that one was that you could get a bunch of birds to follow behind you for some reason like yeah like that, was, that, that was like the whole premise of it was you went around each map to collect these little bird oh people. yeah there they are yeah and once you got like oh yeah so in this level you needed five of them and this person has three already uh so once you got five you would just go to the ring and it would move you to the next stage uh this is probably the most played sonic title i i've I've played uh outside of outside of battle. I feel like post uh Sonic Adventure is like a completely different world of Sonic compared to like the 2D Sonics. Uh, well, he is. is very He's much a different a, character model and everything. Yeah. I I like all the Sonic games. Though. I think they kind of get an unfair rap like people like to hate on them, but they were never amazing games to begin with. I mean, this is yeah. the Sega and the Super Nintendo era we're talking about. It's not like these were Last of Us type masterpieces. They were right. all basically get from one side of the screen to the other over these obstacles. And I, I thought the gameplay was more fun in Sonic, honestly. Um, like, the go fast thing was always better than jump and use your head or whatever the hell Mario's doing when he punches the normal uh, the little box. Normal platform yeah. situation. And this was, I mean, this is revolutionary for the time. Like, some of the stuff looks incredible, even yeah. though it's not real 3D. It looks good. Yeah, it looks good. Uh, my thing was that the uh, Genesis, the audio sounded so much better coming out of a, a Genesis than it did the the chip tunes that you got out of a Super Nintendo. Even though I had a Super Nintendo, uh, my cousin had a had a Genesis, and I would I would go over there and play that all the time. It was good stuff. Yeah, that was the Sega kit. All right. So what do you good what do you what are you playing? Uh, let's go back to the big the big us. What are you what are you playing this week and last week? What you've been up to? So I took a break from Elite last week. Mm-hmm. Um I've been back into Flight Simulator pretty heavy. We have a product that we're about to put out next month, so a lot of my time has been spent 
doing research, looking at some of our competitors, other things, making sure our quality is up to snuff. Mm -hmm. um, I just did a couple of challenges for achievements the other day that took me an entire day to fulfill. <laughs> um, other than that, I, I think I'm done with Resident Evil completely. Honestly, yeah. man, like I, I tried. I can't get into it. Like I got out of that house and the next thing happened. I was like, why though? Like I just rolled my <laughs> eyes. It, like it's going too slow. The pacing is so slow in this one. Like I know like they have all these big set piece moments, but everything in between takes fucking forever with the puzzles and stuff. Even at, at one point, I literally I was like, all right, I'm just going to bring up the guide because I don't feel like doing this. And even using the guide, I was still it took me like 30 minutes to run through all these rooms and go through all the there's no loading screens, luckily, but you still have to go through like the little, you know, you got to go through all this bullshit to get there. You know, there's the wolves and all that stuff you got to fight right. every time. But but I mean, it's not a bad game. It's just I enjoyed the other one so much better. I felt like the other one. And this is the thing about focus. So the other one, you were in the house. And they quarantined you all from these little sections based off what was happening in the story right. at that time. And this one, you've got this entire village, you know, and yes, you'll get quarantined off in a little section for, you know, this act, I'll call it. But that act is, it seems like it's as big as the house was in, in seven. Mm -hmm. And again, like we were talking earlier about having time to game and stuff like that. Like when I signed up for this, it was because I was told, or when I looked at the time to beat, it was like 10 to 12 hours. I'm like, I got 10 to 12 hours, but I did not realize that those 10 to 12 hours were going to be nine hours of puzzles and, or let me say five hours of puzzles, two hours of cutscenes, and maybe like four hours of actual gameplay. Like, right. I'm just not enjoying it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Tom. You didn't buy it for me. My brother bought it for me. Anyway, <laughs> if he was listening, I would feel bad. He's not listening. The only thing that sucks is that he does have me on Steam, so I know he's looking at my playtime, so I'm like, mm, just leave yeah, I haven't really played it. Like, <laughs> yeah, and then no achievements. I'm going to get caught. Arch, I'm going to get caught. So I don't know. I don't know what to do. I do want to beat it, but I gotta, uh, maybe I'll watch a playthrough and see when it gets good, if it does get good, because right now it ain't good. It's mediocre. I mean, based off of what I've watched for it, so I've watched uh, Markiplier play through it, and uh, I realized that by like episode five, he was doing a lot of the heavy lifting for a while. I was continuing to watch it. It wasn't really the game anymore because it kind of does hit like those weird, like obviously every Resident Evil has those weird, like, you know, weird moments in them but it felt like it was just disconnected a little bit in the very beginning and you can't have that in a game that you're expecting someone to invest so much uh time into uh even though it's a shorter game it's one of those games that like doesn't in my opinion there's no real payoff to this game until like very close to the final act is where the payoff kind of comes and you're like Oh, like everything starts making sense at that point. But uh, th that's a that's a long time to ask someone to just sit there and be bored with with old puzzles uh, that that just don't make sense. Like it, it 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 falls victim to the whole concept of uh, you played Fallout 3, right? So Fallout 3, there was always uh, in some of the hidden underground areas there was usually always some door that was half broken, but it was locked. And you're like, okay, well, I would just, you know, reach my arm over, unlock it, and open it. But you're like, no, you have to go through this whole rigmarole to get the key for it. Uh, but, you know, we're not we're not at that state in gaming anymore. So I was like, I don't know. That just seems... And it's it, like, hits you with that almost right up front with, with that level of, of, I don't know, gameplay, I guess. Uh, like right up front. So I was just from watching it, I was like, all right, I know this is not a game that I want to really sit down and invest time into. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm with you. Uh, yeah, it's disappointing because I actually really enjoy the story, but I can't get through it, man. I, I can't. I think I'll give it one more swing over the weekend. Mm -hmm. I'll try to see if I can like knock it out in a single day or something, just marathon through it. But if I go back and there is another hour long puzzle for me to do, that is nothing but go back through all these places I just walked away from, then I'm probably just going to uninstall it. I'll watch a YouTube video. I really yeah. probably won't even watch the whole thing. I just want to know what the fuck's going on because the story is pretty cool. It's like one of those yeah. movies you watch and like you're sitting there like, I don't know what's going on. I'm enjoying it, but I really wanted to get to the end. Like it feels like that. Like it's like one of those things where I don't really care how you get there at this point. I just want to know what happens at the end. Yeah. That's where I'm at now. I think my biggest thing about it was that there was at least early on, there wasn't any type of indication that like 
Umbrella is at all involved in this. And I still don't know for a fact that they are, uh, cause I have missed a couple of those episodes, uh, in between, but, um, I mean, there's, there's information that eventually that I know shows up eventually that it, it kind of starts bringing, it doesn't tie it to umbrella at all, but it starts bringing it in back into the fold. I think that was the weird part is that it just kind of didn't feel like a resident evil game, except for the old puzzle style that they brought back from forever ago for some reason. Uh, I don't know. I'm with you though. It, it, Payoff just isn't there for me. Yeah. I might play seven though. Who knows? You play anything else? Oh, that's good. Um, no, that's pretty much it, man. Um, I want to start up. Um, I want to start. Da, 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 da. I want to start. What the hell's that name of that game? Tell me. Do 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 zombies, biker guy. Oh, Dave. Rum, rum. Yeah, the, <laughs> I do want to. Um, <laughs> I just remember I had a motorcycle from from. Um, I do want to start Days Gone, but because it's also zombie shit, I'm like, yeah, I should probably finish Resident Evil first. Here comes the cities. Oh, bless you. Excuse me. Thank you. Yep, days Gone. Yep, you had it right. Yeah, so I, I do want to play that, but that'd probably be it. I I leveled up, so you probably saw on our admin channel, the Discord. I leveled mm-hmm. up on Elite so heavy that I grinded myself to death. Probably over the course of two weeks, I need a break from that because it was a shit ton of work. Oh, and yeah. then what sucks is one of these days um, I'm looking on Twitter and they put the patch notes out about a patch. And one of the things that I had to do was grind to collect like these 40 opinion polls. And I look at one of the patch notes is opinion polls decrease from 40 to 20. I'm like, oh, that's cool because <laughs> I, I definitely spent a whole day doing that. But oh, God. whatever. But, yeah, so I. In the future, I probably will wait like a week for them to realize that the grinding requirements are a little too heavy. But the thing about this game, though, is um, so I don't know if you knew, but with the weapons and the armor, so you start off with the G1 stuff mm-hmm. and then the gear two, gear three, there's actually shops that sell that stuff throughout the uh, the universe. Yeah. But you is a limited supply, so you have to be the first person to get it, the first person to buy it, whatever. So for that reason, I was bouncing all around. You know, I take a shuttle, obviously. I got money to burn. Like I, I have so much in Elite that I can never go broke. To be completely honest, because right. there's nothing that I can spend it on that will cost that much. So I take the shuttle all over the place now, rather than fly my own ship. So I was just shuttling from station to station. Big balling over here. Big balling, but I couldn't find. Um, <laughs> I really couldn't find any of the the higher level stuff. Honestly, like it is so rare. Um, but after that, I was like, let me just go ahead and all knock out all the grinder requirements because it's pretty easy. Um, mm-hmm. so when you look. You can find online, like the stuff actually makes sense for where you find it from, like the right. opinion polls and stuff for at the tourist locations, because obviously that's where people are coming in, having the polls and talking about how they feel about, you know, the system they're in. Right. All the military defense stuff is at the military sites. You want DNA stuff, you go to the biological places. So it all makes sense in that. Right. In that, you're, not, um, you're not just randomly essence. guessing. Yeah, so it was cool. I like it, but um, I just I took a little break, which is, again, how I say I consume elite. I usually play for like two weeks very hard. And then I'm like, all right, let me back off for a bit, and then I'll pop back in whenever there's something else I want to do. True. My uh, yep. my buddy and I we we picked up Borderlands three uh this past week just to do Oof. no grinding. That the goal is to not grind. The goal is simply we started new characters, ones that we had not played before, to kind of spice it up, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. and we're just doing a narrative run, just straight through. Uh, we're, we're done with the, uh, the first, or like the base game we're already through. God, it, it, playing through it again, just reaffirms my, my feelings about the Calypso twins. They're just, they're just bad character designs, uh, uh, from a, from a ground up. They're just terrible villains and not in a good way at all. Um, we got through that. Uh, we are through the first DLC, which is actually pretty decent. It does lean a lot on your lore knowledge of prior titles. Um, but we, we got through that one and we are starting, I think probably after the stream is, is I'm going to probably meet up with him and, and see what he's doing so that we can continue on. Um, but he's already continued on to the second DLC, which he says is actually really good. And he's surprised that it's taken him so long to, to play this one. 
So I'm interested. We're going in with the complete understanding that we're not grinding for things. Like we have, uh, what are they called? I think it's like a guardian rank in this one. Uh, it was for anyone who's played Borderlands 2 though, and not 3, Borderlands 2, it was called your badass rank. And it's just like, you do, you know, badass things in, in, in your gameplay for one character. Bad. And it's like account wide buffs that you get and you get to pick the buffs. So we have those turned on and we're literally just walking through, uh, the bosses not so much cause they're more, they're less bullet spongy in this game, which is, you know, a, a good thing. Um, they're less bullet spongy. Uh, they're more dynamic in how you have to approach them. So the bosses still take us a little bit of time, but it's not nearly the same amount of time as if we went in with just straight up from ground from ground zero type of characters. Like we had just started playing for the first time. Um, so we're going through that. And then, as I already said, we're, we're going to tr- give Dark Alliance a try. Uh, he actually did pick up Game Pass just like you got a... Uh, he was able to convert like three months of his Xbox Live over to Game Pass Ultimate, I think, um, for like a dollar. So he did that. And so we're going to give Dark Alliance a try tomorrow on, on Xbox. So that'll probably be I what I get so. to play through next week. Um, that's really it for me. Shit. Yeah, good stuff. What about you, viewers? What are you guys playing? Yeah, Thomas, what are you playing? What are you playing, Virtual Girl in uh, the Mauna Kea? And Dr. Pretender, all you guys just sitting there watching us silently. Not silently. Somebody right we're talking. <laughs> I know what Tom's playing. Playing Resident Evil 8 still? Nah, he's on, um, they just released a new DLC patch for Barbie Superstore. So oh, he's been really heavy into been that recently. On that one. He's been waiting on yeah. that one. Does this have the horses? Been, it does. He's been spending a lot on the loot boxes for that one. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you get the what oh, what would, what would they call a loot box for a Barbie game? Like what is that? Makeup pack? Just makeup makeup bag or something? <laughs> yeah. I, what I don't know. What the hell do girls call their little pocket pocket thingies? I don't know. The Monarchia little... said she's playing Mass Effect Legendary, of course, which makes sense. That's right. that's my wife for anyone that doesn't know. She has been playing Which one is she on right now? One, two, or three? She is on three, and this is her Ooh, like her, I think her third, maybe fourth time since the Legendary Edition came out. Holy shit. Yeah, she is efficient in these games at this point. It is wild. I just, I sat in the, uh, in the, the room or before we went live, uh, and I saw it and I was like, man, are you on three already? And she's like, yeah, I'm actually like halfway done almost. I'm like, what are you, how, <laughs> what, well, how is that possible? Second playthrough. She's on her second playthrough. Okay. That makes a little bit more sense, but still like, I don't know. I honestly, if, for a game that I had played already, I probably would have given it one go and been like, all right, cool. That's, that's my playthrough. <laughs> gotcha. And then your buddy says Scarlet Nexus, which I have to look up because I have not seen this. Uh, so, backhand then front hand trying out the scarlet nexus demo oh that's um oh it looks oh this art style is cool as hell that Ooh. is i forget which one that is um scarlet looks nexus. good yeah it's an xbox it's not an xbox exclusive is it this looks really cool huh pc it is on pc comes out in a few days Thank you, kind stranger in chat. <laughs> that is, oh yeah, this one right here. So for anyone that doesn't know, that's this game right here. It's uh, it's very um, near automata like in nature. So it's, it's uh, like art style. Yeah, it looks and it the, looks good. The visual effects are fucking awesome too. Oh Part yeah, I wonder if I wonder if they're uh, pulling from. Uh, PC. It looks like Xbox because they have the the iconography for the controller down there. But most of these games now are all all perfectly blended in with Xbox or PlayStation controllers. Even if you are on PC, you would never know the difference just by the icons that are used. Yes, go Lightning. Thank you, Thomas. I need to catch up on what is happening with that. You have anything else you want to plug? Like, how's the helicopter project? It's going, going? good. It's going good. It's going well. You guys can 
If you're a Microsoft Flight Simulator fan, you can find out more about our development stuff at hypeperformancegroup.com. I'll throw it in chat real quick, but that's hypeperformancegroup.com. We make aircraft for Microsoft Flight Simulator. We did a freeware aircraft um, earlier this year, which was the first helicopter to be released for the sim. Um, we Big are now working on it. Yeah, we're now in the early access portion of our new project, which is the bigger brother to that same aircraft, which is the H145. It's bigger, better. We hire professional modelers on this one. Um, same core development team. So it's turned out very well. Um, the early access launch has been more successful than I could have ever imagined. So happy about that. And now we're just focused on developing. Uh, we do some community updates every other week at this point, just to keep people in progress of what is happening behind the scenes for the development. But we're aiming to have the first release come out in August. So all we ask at this point, you know, subscribe to the YouTube channel, join our Discord. Um, there's a newsletter on our website you can sign up for. So any of those ways, just so you can be in touch whenever we release that. That's, but yeah, that's all. Good to hear. Good to hear. Well, that's all from me. That's it for this episode. We have, what, the recording of this will go up tomorrow uh, as soon as I can get it up tomorrow just to trim off a little bit of off the That's episode. what she said. hey -o. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, uh, catch us on, on Twitter. We'll have our handles up here in a minute on the screen. And uh, we record here every Monday. So if you're new here, thanks for showing up. Give us a like, follow, subscribe, whatever you want to do. Everything helps. And uh, we'll see you again live next Monday, 7 p.m. Eastern time. See ya.